We are excited for our last, but certainly not least, uh, session of our conference, Living Your Best Life as a Patient and Caregiver. In this session, you will gain an understanding of the approaches to optimizing quality of life as a brain tumor patient or caregiver. The first portion of this session will focus on the patients, and the second half will focus on the caregivers. Our presenters today are Dr. Mint. Um, Namish Mohili, who is an Associate Professor of Neurology and Oncology at the University of Rochester. He serves as the Associate Chair for Career Development and Leadership, Neuro-Oncology Division Chief and Leader of the Neuro-Oncology Service Line. Dr. Mohili will be presenting the patient portion. With him co-presenting is Dr. Jamie Jacobs, who is the Program Director at the Center for Psychiatric Oncology and Behavioral Sciences, Director of the Caregiving Research Program at the Massachusetts General Hospital Cancer Center. Dr. Dr. Jacobs will be presenting on the caregiver portion. Additionally, you will hear from patient Tom and caregiver Debbie to share their personal perspective navigating a brain tumor and caring for their loved one. Please welcome Dr. Mohili, who will present first. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you, Emily, for the kind introduction. So uh, as Emily said, I'm a neuro-oncologist, and I've been practicing for the past 15 years. Um, and when I was asked to give a talk about living your best life as a patient, I was pretty excited. I thought this was a pretty neat topic. Um, but as I started to put it together, um, I came to the realization that, that I'm really the least qualified person to do this. Um, I'm not a patient, and I'm not a caregiver of a patient with a brain tumor. Um, and I want to acknowledge that at the beginning, that, that, um, that that's not something that I can tell you how to do and how to live. So what I'd like to do today um, in this talk is really talk about some strategies that you as patients can use to really engage your medical team um, in how you can live your best life. So I have no disclosures, and our objectives today are going to be to develop a strategy uh, to live your best life with a brain tumor, identify some key questions to ask yourself, and we'll go over some of this, learn some strategies in which you can align your values and what's important to you with your medical care. So one of the first steps um, that we work on with patients is to acknowledge the brain tumor um, and the impact that the brain tumor and all of the different treatments have on you as a person. How does this impact your cognition, your language, your ability to talk and understand, your ability to think clearly? How does this impact your emotional health, your physical health, your ability to move and walk around, um, your energy? And we'll talk a little bit about how this can be mental energy or physical energy, your ability to do the things that you do every day that you take for granted go to work um, and be able to do either physical things at work or sometimes intellectual things at work? How does it impact your sex life? How does it impact your family life and how you interact with the people around you? And then how does it affect all, the th all those things that you, you wanna do and that you find exciting and fun and that you really wanna spend your time doing? And one of the things that's important and sort of early in this journey and sometimes even later on in this journey uh, is recognizing how each of these things might have been affected by the brain tumor, by the treatments for the brain tumor, sometimes by other medications um, related to the brain tumor. One of the ways to do this is have a conversation with your loved ones um, and get a sense from them as well. How are these things affected? What are the things that you are struggling with that you were able to do before? Um, talking to folks at work about one of the, some of the things that are harder for you or that you may not be performing as well at. Um, what are things that they see that you might not see? And then what I really advocate for is starting to have a conversation about these things with your medical team. And the purpose of this is for you to know which of these things can we really have some interventions on where we can improve them, and which of these things might not we might not be able to improve, and that we're going to have to learn to, to get around or figure out other ways to cope with. So I think the important questions here with your medical team are: what are the things that you that we expect that you can or can't do based on the impact of the brain tumor? based on the impact of other physical symptoms or some of the medications or treatments you're going through? 
what are the things that we might expect could improve and that are worth putting some time and energy and effort into to get better? What are the, some of the symptoms that might actually get worse? And what are some of the things that might not change at all and stay the same? And here it's okay to you know, really take the time to mourn some of the things that have changed and some of the things that you may not be able to do as well as you could before, um, but also then working on that journey to embrace who you are now um, so that you can move forward um, and figure out the best path to, to really be the best and live the best that you possibly can. So we're going to talk about some strategies, and these are going to be um, related to a few different things. Um, one is the body, and the other is the mind. So when we talk about the body, we're talking about symptoms like weakness, and that can be weakness that you have sort of all over, um, or it could be neurologic weakness. That could be weakness that you have on one side of your body or in particular parts of your body. Seizures, which can be a big part of this disease for some people. And then physical fatigue, that fatigue that gets in the way because you just don't have the strength or the energy to be able to do things. And then the other parts of this that we're going to talk about are how all of this affects the mind. Um, some of this can be brain fog, just that cloudy feeling you have in your head where you, you're just not thinking clearly. Some of this can be a little bit more specific to your problems with getting words out, speaking clearly or understanding what other people are saying. And then other parts that go with the mind are some of um, some things related to mood. Are you down about things? Are you anxious about things? And then finally, mental fatigue. So this is a little bit different than that physical fatigue. This is your mind getting tired um, after a long day and just not having the energy um, to take on some of those next steps. All of these symptoms, it's important to note that all of these symptoms can get worse and they can fluctuate um, when you're sick. Um, when you're really tired, so if you've had a few really busy days um, and you've been out and about a lot, some of these symptoms can feel worse after that. When you're mentally tired or drained from something else, if you had a rough um, conversation with someone or a bad medical visit, some of these symptoms can feel worse. When you're in pain, so if you're having headaches um, or other kinds of pain symptoms, these symptoms can feel worse. When you're feeling down about things, or even something as simple as you haven't had a good night's sleep. So some of the strategies that we can use from a medical point of view to help you when you're dealing with issues with the body. So when we're looking at weakness, um, we'll talk to you about physical therapy. So things that you can do to start to regain your strength to focus on some of the muscles that might be more problematic for you. Um, some of this is also making sure that you can do things safely, like walking and mobility around the house. Occupational therapy can be helpful, um, particularly when you have weakness in your hands um, or trouble with coordinating things. They can give you some strategies to overcome that. Exercise is one of those things that's really been proven to help patients with cancer, um, both mentally and physically. One of the challenges of exercise is if you've been run down by medications or um, aspects of your brain tumor, it can be hard to get back into exercise. We'll talk, to, talk about some strategies for that. And then it's important that you keep active to try and maintain the strength that you have um, as we're, um, and that's something that we talk about a lot with patients is as you spend more time not moving around, some of those other muscles can start to become a little bit weaker. When it comes to seizures, there's a couple of important things. The first and foremost is, is taking your medications. We know that seizures can affect you physically. Seizures can affect you mentally. They can really, for some people, really throw you know, a day or a week or a month off if you have a seizure. So taking your medications to the best of your ability to be able to prevent those. The other side of that is really having open, honest conversations with your doctors about your medication side effects. Um, letting them know if there's side effects that you think you're having to the seizure medicines and have a conversation with them. If you're not sure, asking them, you know, what are the possible side effects I could be having from my seizure medicines? Could this be making me fatigued? Could this be making me irritable? Um, and then having a real conversation about is, is there a, an opportunity or possibility to change some of these um, to make me feel better? Um, we ask patients to work on sleeping well because we know that if you don't sleep well, you can be a little bit more prone to seizures. 
Um, and then we have found that the more that patients are educated about seizures and understand some of the consequences, that the, the better they are with coping with them. Um, and so really working with your medical team to understand, you know, what are the consequences of a seizure and what should I be doing at home if I have a seizure? Um, and we found that, that just having that knowledge in the literature um, can be helpful to reduce anxiety about it. And then as we get to physical fatigue, we have some strategies that you can work with your medical team on. This includes um, exercise. Um, and that although that doesn't seem to make sense, if you're feeling really tired, sometimes getting out and doing a little bit of exercise um, can help you overcome some of that tiredness. Sometimes we'll use stimulant medications um, that can help. That's something to talk to your physicians about. Um, we'll recommend um, things like mindfulness or yoga. And there's some um, literature um, in cancer patients that these things can help with fatigue. Getting outdoors. Um, so if you're not able to do exercise, just being able to be outside for periods of time can help with this. And then the last thing um, that we have found really helps um, patients is, um, is having a purpose each day, having something that you care about or that you want to do, um, sometimes having a schedule or a daily routine um, so that it gets you up and out um, and motivated uh, to do things. So um, this, is, this is from the New York Times. It's a, um, uh, from a writer who talks about how um, we can get over some of the humps that we have in our life where we're procrastinating or we, we can't get into sort of something new, something I talk about with our faculty, and it's something called a microaction. Um, and that's just taking a small step um, towards something. If you haven't been exercising for years or you haven't walked um, for a while, getting back into it can be really daunting. Um, and so instead of saying, well, I need to work myself up to walking a couple of miles, um, you start with a micro action, something like just taking a few steps, um, you know, or getting outside and walking down the driveway as one of your first actions. Um, and then each day building upon that. So this is really starting to take just some of those baby steps um, in relation to exercise, in relation to some of the medical interventions like physical therapy or occupational therapy um, to help you move forward. Now, when we go to the mind, um, some of the interventions are similar. When we think about brain fog, there are mind exercises that people can do. And this can range from if you're able to read or do crosswords, um, do some mind games on a computer. Sometimes it's just having a conversation with other people and keeping your mind active. Cognitive therapy is something that we recommend and they can give you some strategies um, on how to keep your mind awake and active. Um, and then figuring out what kinds of behaviors you wanna to adapt to, like making lists around the house um, to overcome some memory problems, using apps for reminders, post-it notes to remind you about things going on. For speech and language, we'll use things like speech therapy or music therapy that can help you in just getting some of those words out better um, and feeling comfortable with um, how you can get those words out. And then for mood and anxiety, we advocate for talking to your, your providers, any of your physicians or advanced practice providers about whether there's a role for medications for this. Sometimes that is getting you off of other medications that you might be on, and sometimes it's adding new medications to help with um, a bad mood or anxiety. And here also with your providers, you can talk about um, the roles of different types of therapy that you or your family members um, could go through uh, together. Now, mental fatigue, um, not all fatigue is physical. Your brain really has to work harder at times because it's been affected by a brain tumor. It may have been affected by radiation. It may be affected by other kinds of medications. Um, and so some of the strategies can be really helpful here. This is where stimulants probably help the most um, in helping you focus um, and think through your day a little bit better. Um, here's where really looking at your medication list with your physicians, you know, what are the things you really need? What are some of the things that you can, you can potentially get off of? Again, keeping your mind active, both with physical and mental exercise, being outdoors, and then trying to keep some kind of routine or schedule for your life. So last couple of slides, I want to talk about something I talk about a lot with our um, with the physicians we work with on, on how to really design and help them um, get the most out of their careers. 
Um, and that is going through some exercises where you can really help identify and determine what your core values are. And that's really saying, you know, figuring out what's really important to you. Um, and a couple of these examples here are things that you can find through the internet. One is called a peak experience exercise, something where you kind of think about a time in your life where you were, you were really thriving and things were really going well. Um, talk about it with a family member or write about it and look at that and see, you know, what are the values that really came out of that? What were the things that were important to you? There's something called a value sort exercise where you look at a list of values and you cross out the ones that don't really resonate to you and you keep doing that until you're down to sort of five. Um, that might tell you what are the five things that are really important to you. And part of this exercise is to really ask some of those really important questions. What is most important to you? How do you wanna live your life? It's important then to use those values in some of the decisions you have to make about treatment, about who you wanna spend your time with, what you wanna do, whether you wanna stay in work or leave work if you have those kinds of options. And then communicate those values to your loved ones so that they know what's important to you. And then the thing I really advocate is really try to engage your medical team in that. They should know what your values are. They should know what's important to you so that they can really be that ally um, an advocate to work with you as you're thinking about what medications to be on or what to do um, so that you can live your best life. So um, this is an example of some of those um, of, of those core values. Um, and so the exercise here would be you can print this out from the Internet um, would be to look at these. Um, cross out the ones that don't make sense to you or that you don't think are important in your life, and then ultimately try to whittle this down to a list of roughly about five. Um, this is another way of looking at it, and it, um, it classifies those values in a couple of different ways. And here it's important to know if you know something like benevolence is important to you or achievement, um, and that helps you in making some of those decisions um, about your life. I think what's most important here um, is to really think about for you, what is important in your life, um, and then figuring out a way of how you might be able to communicate that with your medical team. I hope you found this helpful. I'm happy to answer questions about this later on. Thank you so much. Okay, hi everyone. Um, I'm very excited to be here and speak with you all today and follow Dr. Mohili as he um, astutely stated, you know, we can only give some advice on how to live your best life either as a patient or caregiver, but um, hopefully this talk will follow some of the tips that he gave because they're very similar when you're the person who's caring for someone who is the patient. And I will just say, um, I have no disclosures, but to start out, I think there are a few assumptions I'd like to debunk. So first is that we're not always taking care of a loved one when we're in our caregiving role. For the people who are attending today, you might be a patient yourself, you might be a caregiver, but even if you are a patient, you might have cared for someone else in your lifetime or currently are a caregiver to someone else. So no matter how you identify, I think these are good strategies and skills for all of us to learn and to try to practice every day. Um, I also say that we don't always like the people that we're caring for, and we don't always like the people that are caring for us. So it's not necessarily that we're always caring for people that we love or even like. But nonetheless, people tend to sometimes find a great deal of meaning in the role of being a caregiver. And the other thing I'll say is that some people don't really identify with the word caregiver. It kind of feels formal. Um, we've had people who have said to us, you know, I'm not her caregiver, I'm her husband. And I really want to just validate that for all of you who might feel that way. We don't have a better word. We've tried words like support person or care partner. And caregiver just seems to be the one that we keep coming back to. So I'll be using that word throughout my talk today, but I acknowledge that you might not identify with that. And to please, you know, as you're listening to me, replace that word with whatever and however you identify. But either way, congratulations for taking the next bit of time and this full hour to focus on yourself. Caregivers, we know, 
have more unmet needs than the patients themselves often that people are caring for. And the needs of the caregivers are often considered secondary or completely overlooked. And there's a great need for us to understand better how we can help people who are caring, especially for patients with brain tumors. You might recognize this list of activities that you're trying to get done in your day everything from taking care of yourself and taking care of the person that is sick with you to emotional support and housework and meal prep. And so really the point of the slide is to say, where is the room for self-care? Where do you even fit in time for yourself? And I want to acknowledge that that is the first step and the struggle. I hope that today I can give you just a few tips and skills that you can use quickly in your day and so that you experience less of that tension between how to find time for self-care and what you actually do when you do find that time for self-care. I am a researcher, um, as Emily said, I'm a researcher at Mass General Cancer Center. And so I'm often trying to understand better what the needs are and then develop and adapt interventions that we know are helpful using things like cognitive therapy, behavioral therapy, mindfulness-based and acceptance commitment therapy. We always start off, start off by exploring the needs of our patients. And in our neuro-oncology center, I worked with one of our neuro neuro-oncologists, Dr. Deborah Forst, to study how, what, what really is the rate, the prevalence of depression and anxiety um, in our patients and caregivers with brain tumors. And what we found was that at any point in time, so this is across from diagnosis, three, six, and nine months after diagnosis, the patients here in the green and the blue is caregivers. Um, at any point in time across this span, patients and caregivers were both reporting about 25 to 30% of them reporting clinically significant depressive symptoms. So that's things like feeling sad or down or blue nearly every day for most of the day or losing interest in things you used to enjoy doing, loss of energy, change in appetite, sleep, feeling guilty or worthless. Now, this is pretty remarkable because it shows that patients and caregivers are sort of tracking together across time and are both experiencing levels of depression that are, that are significant about a quarter to a third. But look what happens when we looked at anxiety. The rates of anxiety in this study were so different for caregivers that at any point in time, they were twice as likely as the patient that they were caring for to be experiencing clinically significant anxiety symptoms, fear, nervousness, being on edge, not being able to really focus on their day-to-day -day lives because they were consumed by worries and fears of the future and uncertainty. And this is pretty substantial. So again, you know, about a quarter of patients are, are also experiencing anxiety, but so many more caregivers. And that we need to be treating this. We need to be doing something about this. And I know I'm preaching to the choir here when I say that. So again, I'm going to leave you today, hopefully with three brief coping strategies, how we enhance communication between our, each other as care partners and care recipients, how we, how we sort of set an intention for self-care so that it's more likely to happen throughout our day, and how we build skills for relaxation so that we sort of dampen the fight or flight response, the stress response that we're so often in every day. So the first, enhancing communication, a few brief skills. The first is that we have a tendency, and a lot of the caregivers I work with report this, it's sort of a phenomenon called protective buffering. We wanna protect each other from our fears, our worries, sadness. We don't wanna cause sadness in the other person. So we keep from them what we might be most concerned about. Well, this actually leads to a breakdown in communication, worse communication, and a, an experience really of isolated coping, that people are not coping together with a problem, but they're separately in their silos dealing with the same issue and not talking about it. The way to relieve distress, the way to relieve tension and to increase shared coping, the experience of feeling like you're working through something together is actually to share and to communicate about those fears, no matter how uncomfortable it feels. So how do we do that? These are four little things I want you to ask yourself. First, if the situation were reversed and that person was caring for you, would you want 
him or her to keep their worries from you? Or would you want to actually share, have them share them with you? If a friend were in your situation, what advice would you give to them? Would you say, yeah, you shouldn't really talk about that with the person you're caring for? You know, that might upset them. Or would you say, you know, you might want to share that because they might be feeling the same way as you and talking about it will bring you closer together. So what advice would you give to a good friend? And what's the worst that can happen if you really did share some of those fears with the person you're caring for? Is Would it be as bad as you think it will be? There's also these three Fs, we call them, statement of fact, feeling, and fair request. This is a way that we can communicate more assertively rather than indirectly or passively. So we can say, when I see that you're X, Y, Z, this example I use is not related to caregiving because I like to sort of teach things in a more general sense and then have people insert their own examples with something that they're dealing with. So think, if you will, for a moment with me about something you're struggling with and maybe something you've been trying to communicate to the person you're caring for or to the person who's caring for you. And give the statement of fact first. When I see that you're sad, statement of feeling, I feel nervous, I feel bad, I feel like I've been a burden on you. Statement of fair request, I would like you to let me know if you're feeling this way because of me. I would like you to let me know how I might be able to help you through this situation. So this is, again, a way that we can work on being more assertive with each other. And then finally, how do we enhance social support, not just from the patient and caregiver perspective, but for the caregiver to have their own circle of support, which is so, so important. And how do we optimize that? So if you are the caregiver, think of the situation that you're in and identify what do you really need? Is it that you need some practical support? Is it that you need emotional support? And then think of who in your, in your world is good at giving those types of supports. Maybe you have a friend or family member who's really good at, at jumping to when you need something, going to do your grocery shopping or driving, you know, helping to drive the person you're caring for somewhere. But maybe you have someone else who's not so good at jumping into, in, into the line of fire like that, but they're really good at talking and listening and giving you some emotional support and encouragement. So identify that right person. And then also notice, do I have any barriers to asking for help or to receiving support? Do I think I should be able to do it all myself? Do I think that asking for help makes me seem weak? Do I think I'm burdening others? And then sort of go back to some of those questions and say, well, am I really burdening others? Would I feel burdened if someone came to me and asked for help? And if the answer is no, then why do you think that you're burdening other people? And might you be able to overcome that barrier and ask the question and see how it goes? So that's the final step is really challenging yourself as to whether those beliefs that you hold about asking for help and receiving support are really accurate. You know, is it that it is really a sign of weakness? Have I been told that my whole life, but maybe do I need to start to shift that core belief that I have and know that if I'm going to get through this time and take care of myself and be the best caregiver because I myself am whole, then I do need to garner the support around me and accept the help that I'm being offered. And sometimes we really do need to tell people what kind of help we need because you might have realized throughout this experience that even though people want very much to help, they don't always know what to do or say. And sometimes the things they say aren't so helpful or the things they do aren't so helpful. Well, that's an opportunity to be more direct with your friends and your family and say, you know, I see that you really wanna help. You know what would be really helpful for me? And then tell them. By telling them, you're actually making them feel even better because then they can really do the thing that they want to do, which is help you. I'm gonna move now into the second strategy, which is setting an intention for self-care. With this, I want you to think of this also as a multi-step process. So step one is to really think about what is something that you like to do. You yourself, not, not necessarily something that you like to do as a partnership, as mother and daughter, or as siblings, or as spouses, but what is something that I used to like to do myself, and can I incorporate it back into my life somehow? And if the answer is no, it's really hard to do, I don't have the time to do it, I don't have the energy to do it, or it's too far away, then we move into step three, which is really the crux of this um, goal-setting exercise. 
Do I need to do it differently? How might I be creative about adjusting that thing I used to like to do? And I'll give you an example of what I mean. Step four is noticing barriers. Again, we're always wanting to say, what are the barriers I can anticipate so that I'm more likely to overcome them? When I can anticipate them in advance, I can establish a backup plan, which is step five. And then step six is, six is to really make that plan and say, this is what I'm going to do on this day for this amount of time. And if it rains, I'm going to do plan B. And this is what plan B is. And this is how I will execute plan B. And the more likely we are to have that as a set part of our schedule and part of our day, the more likely it actually is to happen. So I said I would give you an example. So this one is really simple. Working out at the gym, that is something that this person that I had once worked with liked to do. So we talked about how can they incorporate this back into their lives? Well, they felt I could, but maybe not at the gym. That was too far. They couldn't be away from the person they were caring for for too long. And so the adjustment, the creative, different way they can engage is take a walk or jog around the neighborhood. And if weather gets in the way, then they have a backup exercise at home. And the plan is really specific, if you notice, thinking of sort of our SMART goals. SMART stands for specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, and time-oriented. So we're setting a goal that we really have concrete and laid out for ourselves. This more creative example, I can't take credit for, but someone I worked with said they really used to love to travel. They can't travel right now. So the way that they were creative in step three is to watch a travel show on some country or city they wanted to go to, like let's say Greece, and then they would order Greek food and eat the food while they watched the show. And it was sort of a night that they had created for themselves that was protected and was oriented around this place that they would like to go. And there was some shared enjoyment in doing that. So again, this is the most creative example that I've heard of and have, but it can be anything that you used to like to do, journaling, scrapbooking, dancing, getting a massage, find a way to tweak it. Find a way to make it more manageable, that you can integrate it, and that you can accomplish it. Now, the final thing I wanted to talk about today was building relaxation skills. Why? The reason for this is that when we're in a heightened state of stress, which happens when you're caring for someone, chronically we end up with elevated levels of certain chemicals in our body that are really good to have. They're, they're there because they help us to respond to stress. And it's been adaptive, evolutionarily adaptive. It's why we've survived all this time as a species. However, when we're in chronic states of stress, those chemicals, adrenaline, cortisol as a hormone, don't really ever go down. So they stay at this elevated level, or at least our body tries to keep them at this elevated level. And that causes a whole host of physical issues for us, inflammation, sleep issues, more stress and wear and tear on the body physically. So the goal is to engage in the relaxation response, which allows that adrenaline to come down and the cortisol to come down. We're less likely to get sick acutely or chronically with more serious conditions. So the goal of building relaxation skills is to be able to activate that relaxation response more quickly so that we dampen the chronicity of the stress response. So if you will join me in just one minute, we're going to do just one of these boxes, but you can pick one, two, three, or four. If you're doing your hands and arms, you're going to hold your arms at sort of a 45 degree angle, making fists not so hard that you're causing pain, but just tightening. If you're doing the face and neck, you're going to really squinch your whole face together. If you're doing your chest, shoulders, back, be careful you have back issues, but you're going to arch your back and squeeze your shoulders together. And then your thighs, calves, and feet. If you choose this one, you can lift your feet off the floor and you're going to if these are my feet, sort of flex them and point them inward. So join me for a moment. I'll trust that you're all doing this with me and close your eyes and just allow yourself to get into a comfortable position. Maybe you feel your feet on the floor. You feel yourself grounded in your chair. And for a moment, you focus on your breathing, breathing in and breathing out. 
and start to focus on the muscle group, either your arms and wrists and hands, or you've chosen your face or your chest, shoulders and back or your legs and feet. And now squeeze those muscles, just as I showed you, I'm doing the hands, pull and hold, remain tight, squeeze for three, two, one, and relax. Letting all the tension go, just noticing the difference between tension and relaxation in the body. And again, squeeze the muscles of your arms now, hold, for three, two, one, and relax, letting all the tension go. And when you're ready, you can open your eyes and join me back in the space. Normally we would do that for five minutes or 10 minutes or 15 minutes, but the point of progressive muscle relaxation is to notice that difference between tension and relaxation because it's sort of like a pendulum. The more tense you are, the more relaxed your body can become. And how often we go through the day not realizing that we're holding tension in our body, that our shoulders have been up by our chin or that we've been clenching our jaw. And this progressive muscle relaxation or PMR as we call it is a way to increase awareness of that tension in our body so that we can more easily notice it and release it throughout the day so that you're not likely to get to the end of the day and be in pain because you've been tense all day. I encourage you to look online, on YouTube, on, on apps. There's so many apps these days on your phones to find relaxation exercises that work for you, that you like. A lot of people that I work with, both patients and the caregivers, tend to like this progressive muscle relaxation because it's what we call an active relaxation. You're doing something with your body by tensing and releasing. And so it keeps people a little bit more engaged than one that's more visual in nature, um, where people sometimes report tending to fall asleep or things like that. So I'll end there. Um, just encouraging you to find some time to incorporate progressive muscle relaxation or another relaxation into your day. I've listed some additional resources here that you might want to check out for more support. Um, and I really thank you for taking the time today to learn these coping strategies, to um, practice them over the week, even in five or 10 minute increments. Um, and to know that taking care of yourself is really just as important as the person you're caring for. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Jacobs. That was definitely a well-needed relaxation, um, especially to end this conference. At this time, I will ask uh, Tom and Debbie to please join Dr. Mohili and Dr. Jacobs to participate in a facilitated Q&A to share their experience as a patient and caregiver. Welcome, Tom and Debbie. Hi. Hi. All so right, uh, let me take a minute to introduce um, Tom and Debbie. Um, so full disclosure, Tom is one of my patients at the University of Rochester, so I can only say nice things about him. Um, <laughs> Tom, um, I met about a year ago, uh, and he was diagnosed um, with a glioblastoma. He presented with some um, problems with vision um, and noticed that he was having some trouble reading, was found to have um, a tumor and underwent surgery, um, was diagnosed as a glioblastoma, uh, and then after that went through radiation and concurrent chemotherapy, and then an additional six months of chemotherapy, which I believe he, he finished up um, this spring. Um, one of the things that's interesting about Tom is um, I really remember the first time I met him, and one of the reasons for that is because he had come um, not with Deborah, his wife, but had come with another family member. Uh, and that's because Deborah at that time was undergoing treatment for another cancer. Um, and so I think you can imagine um, how you know, difficult uh, this early part of the journey was for them. Uh, but one of the things that has struck our entire medical team about Tom and Deborah um, is how intentional they've been from the get-go um, about both dealing with the cancers and everything that goes with that, but also dealing with life 
um, and figuring out how to go through day to day, um, but also how to go through kind of the fun um, and important and exciting stuff. Um, and so that's one of the reasons we invited them here to, to share some of um, their experiences. So, so welcome, Tom and Deborah. Hello, thank you. And, and just anything to add to that, um, um, you know, introduction, anything there that, you know, I missed or? No, it's very good. You have us walking on water. I don't know if I can do that. <laughs> well deserved. So our, our first question for you, um, this is for Tom. Um, so what, what is, what's most important for you to, to, to be able to kind of live your best life? What, what are the things that you've identified as being important to you? I think family is one of the very, very big things. I mean, we have four daughters, uh, eight grandchildren. Uh, we don't always uh, like them around, but most of the time we do. They're, they're children. So, yeah, it's very important for me to do that and very important for me to, and uh, Debbie to be together. So those are, that's the big thing. And then, um, and, and can you talk a little bit about have there been any any strategies or any things that you guys have really worked at to make sure that you know you you can make that work and that you can you can live that way? I don't, I don't think we changed our strategy much from being before the diagnosis. Uh, we make it a point to try to get together with our children. They're not all in our town. Some are in uh, New Mexico and Philadelphia, Boston, and then in our hometown, Rochester. So we make arrangements to fly, we make arrangements to drive. We try to get together, they try to get together with us, and we just, we make it happen. Okay, good, good. And then um, are there things that you wanna do now that, you're, that you have trouble with? Um, and, you know, and, and, and how do you approach that? How do you, how do you figure that out in your life? Well, the biggest thing is not being able to read. I mean, I, uh, not being able to read kind of was like an instant one day thing last fall and uh, couldn't figure it out. But then we got the diagnosis as cancer, and give, you know, brain cancer. Uh, and, and so Debbie helps me read. Uh, we have been talking to American Blind and, uh, and Visually Impaired. They've been helping us a little bit uh, by the way, getting some software that fits on our phone and we can point the phone at something and it'll read to us. I do a lot of uh, audio books and of course watch television. So it's not the same as being able to sit down and read and close the book and open the book. And some of the time things I'm having, uh, you know, a little problem with is, you know, remembering things that I've read. So uh, I ask questions, sometimes I take notes. So that's, that's the biggest thing. And I couldn't drive for a while, 10 months, no, no driving. And now I'm driving again. So that's, that was good. Um, but that's the biggest thing was the reading. I mean, I was a voracious reader at one time. Okay. Thank you. Um, Dr. Jacobs. Yeah. Thank you so much. And thank you, Tom and Deborah for being here. Everything that Tom's talking about, you know, having periods of time where he wasn't able to drive, not being able to read, places so much on you, Deborah. How do you manage that and also pay attention to your own wants and needs and physical health and emotional health? Well, it, it definitely has been a journey. So in the very beginning, dealing with both of our cancers and both of our surgeries and both of our treatments um, was super overwhelming. And I think then you're just in this survival mode, like how, how, trying to deal with the reality of the cancers and how we're gonna cope through this, how we're gonna move on with this, how are you gonna live with this? And we're both pretty positive individuals. So um, I think we feed off of each other. And, and for me, I know when I have to take care of myself, I mean, I know I get a lot more irritable and I just need to uh, do something for me. And I, and I just do that. I schedule that in. Um, but on a day-to-day -day basis, it is very challenging. Most, most days we're really in the, the portion of the journey where Tom is doing extremely well. We can travel a bit. We can, we can pretty much do, um, 
what we wanted to do. We were both working full time. Tom had to quit his job because he couldn't read and being a professional engineer it, it, and you really can't perform that job. And then I worked for the company. So we both retired um, this year and have been closing our business. So there's been a lot of issues with that as well, a lot of struggles, and we just managed to keep moving on. We're really big into exercise. We've done restorative yoga. We've signed up for Nia fitness classes together. Um, we, you know, we, we just try to make every day the best day it can be given our situation. Thank you for sharing that. I mean, it sounds like there are times where it's been harder that you're acknowledging and times now where it feels like you're able to do some things. And you mentioned something about scheduling activities in. And I think that's so important for people to hear that if they're on the schedule, they're more likely to happen. Um, and even if it's a small thing. And the other thing you said that I think is so important for people to hear is that you know yourself and you get irritable if you haven't done enough for yourself. And I think that's another piece that caregivers can pay attention to is what, it, what are your own personal warning signs that you're sort of becoming overworked, feeling overburdened, um, you know, the, the burnout signs, if you will. Um, and so knowing that about yourself is, is so helpful. It sounds like it has been to you. Um, some of our caregivers talk a lot about feeling guilty when they are doing those things for themselves and taking time for themselves. How do you cope with guilt? How do you cope with stress? Do you have any strategies that are helpful? Um, I, I, I honestly don't feel like I have a lot of guilt. I feel like I'm proactive. We talk about, we really talk about everything. We've cried about everything. We, um, it, you know, there are times where you overreact and, and, and you go back and say, okay, I understand that he cannot help that. And, and you just forgive yourself. <laughs> I mean, you're like, you're human. Um, it's it's life you're you just need to sort of roll with all of these punches and you know you're constantly being bombarded by you know different struggles that you have to overcome and um I guess I don't dwell so much on feeling guilty all the time I try to move past that and how do I do that um <laughs> maybe just talking about it maybe just talking through you know, and apologizing even, you know, on times where you need to apologize to people in general. It doesn't necessarily have to be your husband or your, your the patient that you're trying to help, but just not allowing so much of the guilt because you're really doing the best that you possibly can to help the situation. Does that Thank answer you. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you for sharing that. I think what you're pointing, what you're pointing out is communication is key, which is something that we, we know, but it's so hard to do sometimes is to really talk about what's actually going on. And the other thing you said is to not dwell on the things that maybe you can't change. Um, and that's an important piece because if there's something that you can do, you can control, then you can take action on, but there are other things we can't control and moving forward is, is, a, is one way that we can relieve ourselves of some of that, the bad feelings. I know I would so appreciate you thinking about these topics together. And I know we're also going to move into a Q and A um, with the bigger audience now. So I guess while we're waiting for some of those questions to come in, um, Debbie, one of the things you said um, was you, you commented on how um, Tom's kind of in this good phase now where he's, he's, you know, he's really, he's really doing well. Um, how do you cope with that? Uh, and, and what I mean is, is, you know, with a disease like glioblastoma, where we, you're, you're, you have scans every couple of months and you have the anxiety, how, how do each of you deal with that part of it? Do you want to talk first? Do you want me? Well, as it gets closer to going in for the MRI and meeting with your, your group, you know, I get a bit nervous but I don't feel bad uh, going in and it seems that I'm doing okay. So once I get that, I'm kind of back on, back on cloud nine. 
I think in the very beginning, I was super anxious about the whole going in for an MRI and what if, what if, what if. And Tom said something early on to me, like, why are we worrying about something that we don't, you know, it's, there's nothing to worry about right now. Let's worry about it when the time comes to worry about it. And it sort of made sense to me. So I've kind of gone into these MRIs now. Yeah, you think about it because ultimately this could and very likely will come back. And how will that come back? And But all that uncertainty is, it's not helpful right now. It's, you know, it's better to deal with it when the time comes and then deal with it the best you can. That's great insight and advice, Deborah. Thank you so much for that. Um, I'll help to moderate some of the questions from our attendees. Just as a reminder, if you do have a question that you want to ask, you can type and submit it on the right-hand side of your screen by clicking on ask a question. Or if you're on our mobile app, just scroll down to the bottom of the session to access the Q&A portion. All right, uh, Deborah, we have a question for you here asking about if you used any caregiver specific support groups and if you might be able to share any caregiver resources that you found beneficial. So as part of the Wilmot Cancer Center here in Rochester, they, at the very beginning, put us in touch with a support group. So there is a, a social worker that contacted us numerous times and we have monthly meetings on Zoom. And those have been very useful because there's other patients there and you see people at different stages and you get to talk to people about different coping mechanisms. And that has been really helpful. I have not ventured beyond that. We have a pretty large family. And so our family is very much involved in us in everything that's going on. So we have had a lot of family members visiting um, throughout this past year. Um, so I guess that's some of my support group. That's great to hear what a wonderful support you have from, from family and friends. I know that makes such a big difference when you're going through something like this. All right, another question we have, uh, Dr. McGill, this one is for you. Do you have any um, tips on how patients can manage anxiety between scans? And actually, I'd love to also hear Tom's insight on that as well. So maybe let's start with you, Dr. McGill, and then Tom can, can share some insight on how he might cope with some of that anxiety. Yeah, I, I mean, that's a tough question. I, I, I you know, Debbie um, alluded to, to some of that just now about, um, you know, trying to figure out ways to sort of put that out of your head. Um, you know, and I'll say in our experience, we have, we have patients who can do this where until the day of, you know, they can keep it out of their head. And then we have other patients where kind of a week or 10 days before, um, start, <clears throat> start to get really anxious about it. Um, I think I, I, ha I don't have great advice on this. I actually think Debbie's advice on this was the best was, you know, you, you, you can't, you know, can you, can you avoid, can you not worry about something that you don't know about, um, uh, it's easier said than done. And I think that some patients can do that. And then for some um, others that can't, we have one patient um, who gets so anxious about this that we don't tell them about their scans. His wife um, uh, schedules the scan and then the patient doesn't know until that day because it, it can be so debilitating for a week or two before that scan. I'm not advocating for that strategy, but I think, you know, uh, you know, we want to be creative on just, you know, not letting this get in the way um, too much of, of your lives. Thank you, Dr. Mahili. That's some great advice. Uh, Tom and Debbie, do you want to add anything about, about how to cope with that scan anxiety, the anxiety you get when you have a scan coming up? I have to kind of pair what Debbie said. I mean, I don't really tend to worry about it. Uh, I mean, I may wake up in the middle of the night thinking about it sometimes, but I try to keep myself very busy every day. So I'm too busy to, to worry about it. I guess that's one way of putting it. And I might think about it maybe the day before or two days before or something. But if I'm feeling well, I don't worry about it at all. Thank you so much. Um, 
Debbie, we have another question for you. Uh, can you share how you manage making time for yourself as you're supporting Tom? Um, in the beginning, like when he was going through his treatments, it was it was very difficult because you don't really want to leave them and they don't want you, you to leave because you are their support system. And I would, I would schedule, I would schedule somebody to be with him so that I could go out and do whatever I needed to get done. Um, I, I think the key is you need to schedule, you need to look at your week. And if your week looks like it's going to be a manageable week, then you just need to say, okay, I, I've got a, a book a massage, I've got a book a haircut, you know, I mean, like things that people just need to do. And you don't think about that. Everybody just does that. I need to go to lunch with a friend. Right? Um, and you just, you just do that. And if you're so worried about leaving your patient, then you need to get somebody to fill in there for you. You really do need to rely on family and friends just for sanity. <laughs> That's great advice. And I think that advice of scheduling in, walking out that time is, is definitely key. Dr. Jacobs, uh, you shared some wonderful exercises. I loved the progressive muscle relaxation exercise we got to do together. Do you know, uh, or can you maybe share some places that our attendees can turn to to find guided recordings of exercises like this and some of the ex other exercises you share? Sure. Um, I was just going to open my presentation back up because I remember a few of them off the top of my head. So some of the apps that are pretty well known are Calm, C-A-L-M, uh, Headspace. Um, uh, those are the two that I use most frequently. If anyone looks up John Kabat-Zinn, he established the Mindfulness-Based Stress Reduction Program at UMass originally. Um, his book, The Full Catastrophe Living, is a good one to start with. Um, but I would start with those two apps. And um, if you're not, you know, if you don't have a smartphone, if you're not into apps, even just looking on YouTube and putting in the search bar relaxation, um, some places will have like a phone number that you can even call for a guided relaxation over the phone. Um, so I, I suggest starting there. That's great. Thank you. And for anyone looking for those resources, I did put it in the chat of this session as well. So you can access some of those links there. We'll take just one last question. Uh, Dr. Mahili, you had shared um, value exercises in your presentation. Do you, kind of similar to Dr. Jacobs, do you know of a place that attendees can turn to to find that online, maybe a link or a website where they can find those exercises? Yeah, I don't, I don't have a specific place. I actually, if you go into Google and you put in peak values exercise and you put in value sort, um, it comes up with a couple of different options um, and, they, and those links really guide you through um, how, how you can do that. Thank you so much. That is all the time that we have for this session. Thank you, Dr. Jacobs, Dr. Mahili, and Tom and Debbie for this wonderful session. I'm going to turn it back to Emily. Very welcome. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much, Dr. Mohili, Dr. Jacobs, and Tom and Debbie for sharing your personal experience. And thank you for closing out our two-day national conference, especially highlighting um, the importance of taking care of self as patient and as caregiver.